Well, the first one is more the quantitative sense of part rate. Right? And then, um, these are distinguished back, that's the most known um, composed whole, right? With the, what they call the universal whole, right? Okay. And, you know, later on, we'll do this in logic. And the composed whole is put together from its parts, right? But not set of its parts. And the universal whole is set of its parts but not put together from them, okay? But the first meaning of whole in part is the composed whole. So we might say that the, the word cat is composed of C, A, and T, right? Okay? And uh, you might say, if the chemists are right, that water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen, right? Okay? And the family is composed of the mother and the father and the children, right? Okay. But then the universal whole is set of its parts, huh? Like uh, number is set of odd number and even number, right? Or parts of number, right? Okay. So you're talking about the general and the particular, but the word particular is taken from the word part. Right? It's a different sense of part, huh? So number is not put together from odd and even number. But number is said of odd and even, right? Okay. An animal is not put together from dog, cat, and horse, but it's said of them, right? Otherwise, to say a dog is an animal, you say that a dog is composed of cat, dog, horse, and elephant, right? Okay. Now, you know, if you look, you know, going back to my, our friend there, John Locke, he's talking about the general idea of triangle. He says it's a scaling, isosceles, equilateral. He says, well, it's all none of these. He's looking at the universal whole as if it were composed of the what? things that set up. He's confusing the what? Composed whole with the what? Universal whole. Okay. But then Aristotle goes on to distinguish two other kinds of what? Of composed whole. And one of course is the definition. Okay. And the other is the composition of what? Matter and form. Huh? Okay. Now, um, take a very simple example of that. Huh? If you had the word cat here on the board, I don't know, I, I, this is my show. If you had the word cat here, what are the parts of the word cat? Yeah. And that might seem to be the only parts of the word cat, right? Because you take away the C and the A and the T, Nothing's left, right? So there's nothing in the word cat except C, A, and T, right? Okay. But then, when you look at the word act, same word? Not exactly the same letters, right? Mm -hmm. Not the same word, right? Same letter, right? The same word? Okay. But there's something in the word cat besides the letters, isn't there? So you might say that the word cat is put together from the letters and the order of the letters. Okay? And the word act is put together from the same letters but a different order. So you can speak of the letters and the order as the parts of the word cat. But you obviously use the word part in a different sense than you start off with. Okay? You wouldn't think of the order of the letters as being a part of the word, would you? At first. Would you? And yet it's intrinsic to the thing, and that's what you mean by a part of the way, right? You wouldn't have the word cat without that order, would you? So in a way, um, the word cat involves the letters and the order of the letters. The rubber ball involves what? What the parts of a ball? Rubber and the shape, right? Those are in a sense parts, but it's not parts in the way in which C, A, and T are parts. Okay. That's 
different sin. So what Aristotle does is distinguish three senses of the whole whole. The first one is kind of the quantitative one, right? And then the one that mattered before, or in the broad sense to include not only shape but order, right? And then um, the parts of the definition. Or different senses of the part. In the fifth book of the Metaphysics, he talks about all the words that are mainly used in the wisdom because of its generality, but they're used in the axioms, right? And used to some extent everywhere. Um, okay, so, so basically, there's the two parts composed in the universal that they proposed as three parts. Three senses, yeah. Three senses. Yeah, yeah. The quantitative one is the one that's most known to us, right? Yeah, and then quantitative, oh, okay, yeah, so like um, yeah. all the parts of the body make up the body. Yeah. Yeah. Notice why it's more known to us. So you could you could divide up the body, put the liver here and the heart here and the lungs here, right? Uh-huh. You know, so they had to take the word cat and put the cut it up, you know, put the C here and the A here and the T. Uh-huh. But you can't put the the letters here and the order of the letters here, so it's less manifest to us that these are distinct. When you compare cat and act, or dog and god, huh? then you realize there's something in the word cat besides the three letters. What is that? In this case, it's the order, right? Okay. The letters, like the yeah. matter and the form. A form in general. The form is used not just for shape, right? But for the act, the order. The order. And uh, parts of the definition. Two, two of these uh, senses of heart are found in the real world, outside the mind, right? Yeah. Quantitative yeah. parts yeah. and matter and form. Right. But the parts of definition are more in the mind, and the general in particular, right? The universal is only in the mind. Huh? And what what Waithius is saying, a thing is singular in sense, and universal and understood. So when you divide the general in particular, you're talking about of universal, that's in the mind, the things are universal. And the parts of the definition are universal. What's defined as universal. However, the great says the first thing to be considered in logic is universal. Yeah. Maybe make that a little more sensible and say that the first thing to be considered in logic is is name instead of many things. And you'll see us might be meant to that here in the first meeting, you know, name instead of many things. Um, so that, uh, but the name of what is defined is a name set of many things, and the names of the definition are names set of many things. But so something's universal only in the mind, see? So two of those senses, parts of the definition, and then the, you know, the general in particular, the genus and the species, is divided into. That's in the mind, too. Although it has a foundation in things, huh? The foundation things for those ones in the mind is matter and form, basically. We'll see that as we get on, because the, the genus is the differences like matter is to form, as Paul said. The, the universal, that's a sense of um, as, uh, how we could speak of um, like dog, cat, man as parts of animal, that would be a universal Yeah, but all of these are said of many things, so they're all universal, right? Man, dog, horse, but animal is more general than they are, even more universal. But outside the mind, everything is like singular, right? 
never had men in general sitting in my class. <laughs> I taught humanity too. <laughs> what? I taught humanity too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never danced with women in general, so it's this particular woman. <laughs> Aristotle does this to distinguish, you know, you might say the, you know, the basic meanings of these words, right? But you can attack sometimes to each meaning on a number of meanings that are very close. And, but that's below the notice of the virus. So I'm not going to see that they're closest to what I do, something. He doesn't succeed big, so. It's not as far as connecting with the kind of contempt for St. Thomas. Well, I say it goes all the way back to the Greeks, so the Greeks thought you had to stop and talk about these things, you know? You know you'll notice when you get into that, that thing about calling a thing by its own name, you know? that expression in its own, one's own, my own, your own. That phrase is what? That one would be. So we live now in the age of sound bites, and that's what yeah. people know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I speak of my own watch, right, then I can speak of my own mother. Is that sense of my own the same there? Do you possess your mother? <laughs> I'm not thinking that so much, see. But um, uh, nobody uses watch but me. Okay. Or take my own head. Nobody else has his head. Uh -huh. Okay? And my own mother. Is she only my mother? Yeah. yeah. I can speak of my own country. My own city, my own state, right? Mm -hmm. Same sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. now, this is a very important distinction, right? Mm -hmm. and the meanings of my own. Are, it's going to be very important for logic, but it's also very important for practical philosophy. Huh? life, my own country. Jesus Christ, my own Savior, what did you say? Yes, 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 yes. my own teacher? Yeah. My own teacher in John Martin has been you, Betty. Yeah. Well, some of my brother Mark, too, but, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you could be my own teacher. Search it, go and get you could buy it and study. Okay. You are good. See my own teacher? Mm -hmm. your teacher too, isn't he? Yes. My own head? Anybody else's head? Is this anybody else's head? Uh, huh? Yeah. Becoming our head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. I could say to these guys, everyone has his own head. 
Yeah, but, I, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I have two different senses here of, of the phrase in my own. If I speak of my own wife, huh? she's nobody else's wife, huh? Now, uh, I might speak of my own daughter. You know, some people say, "Well, you shouldn't say that. You should say, you, should say, you, you know, our daughter." I say, "What is it now? Can I speak of my own daughter, my own mother?" And when I say that Rosalie is my own wife, she's nobody else's wife. Okay? When I say my own mother, she's somebody else's mother besides mine, right? And yet she's my own mother, right? My own daughter, right? She's somebody else's daughter besides mine. But still, is it incorrect to say that she's my own daughter? This is my own child. I have to say she's our child. That's true too, right? But I can still say she's my own daughter, my own flesh and blood, right? But it's my own mean the same instead of my daughter instead of my wife. And my own wife is nobody else's wife. My own head is nobody else's head, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? But my own mother and my own daughter is somebody else's mm -hmm. mother and somebody else's what? daughter. Correct, is it? But, but it's a different meaning, right? <clears throat> I think the first meaning of my own is what belongs to me alone. Right. See? But then there's a second sense of my own, right? What belongs to me, but not only to me, right? My own daughter, my own mother, my own country. I speak of my own God. Uh, Second sense. Yeah. I mean, see, at first sight, you, you, you might think I'm using it in the wrong, you know, in, in a false sense, right? My own God. Eh? My Lord and my God. Yeah, yeah. He's mine. He's my God. He's not my God in the sense that he's what? Truth is my own good. What sense is it should be my own good? Truth. Second. Second sense, yeah. yeah. So do we define something by its own name or the name of another thing? Mm -hmm. If you're stuck in that first meaning of its own, mm -hmm. then you'd be trying to define dog by dog, yeah. cat by cat, mm -hmm. and that would uh, obviously, you know, not get you anywhere. Okay. Well, yeah. But when I call a dog, let's say an animal, am I calling a dog by its own name? No. Oh, and, and, and yeah, okay. Um, uh, it's in the second set. Yeah, yeah. 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 When I call a, <coughs> a square parallelogram, am I calling it by its own name? The name of this glass. Yeah, is that that's its own name. Yes. Are there any other glasses around there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See. See. Yeah. 
it's very important to make that distinction, right? Because um, for logic, you, if you don't see the distinction, then there's no names you can define a thing by. You can't define a thing by its own name, and you can't define it by the name of another thing. So you're out of luck. She actually define a thing by its own name in the second sense. Huh? But I say it's very important for, for, for practical philosophy, right? Um, because in some sense, um, you've got to see uh, the common good as your own good, right? In some sense, right? Not in the perverse sense that you make it your own private good, <laughs> but you got to see it as, as your own good. And if I remember the basketball team, right? Is victory my good? Is the good of the team. Well, yeah, yeah. But if you call it my good, right? It should be in that second sense, right? right? But I should really see that as my good, right? In some sense, direct to the team, right? As a philosopher, I should see truth as my good. That's the good I make. That's my good. But not my good in the sense that this is a private good of playing Berkeley's the truth, right? I was saying you have to love wisdom as a common good, right? You have to love truth as a common good, you know. Um, you have to love God as a common good, right? But in the second sense, he's my good. He's my chief good, God. You know? And he's my greater good than the good which is mine alone, <laughs> Right? Standing the true or the false, and then reasoning. Huh? And the first act is presupposed to the second, and the second is presupposed to the third. I couldn't understand that it's true that man is an animal or that man is not a stone, unless I had first understood in some way what a man is or what an animal is or what a stone is. And I couldn't reason until I had some statements to reason from. Now, how are these three acts uh, directed or ordered or perfected then? Well, chiefly they're perfected by three speeches. Meaning by speech as we've defined it, vocal sound, uh, signifying by custom or by agreement, human agreement, having parts that signify by themselves. So the three chief speeches that perfect these three acts of reason are definition, which perfects understanding what a thing is, statement, which is necessary for understanding the true or the false, and syllogism, and other kinds of argument, that perfect reasoning. <clears throat> so uh, definition is speech signifying what a thing is, or speech making known what a thing is. Sometimes I say it makes known or signifies distinctly huh, what a thing is, and more so than a name could ever do. Because the name doesn't have any parts that signify separate thing. But the definition is a speech and therefore has parts that signify separate thing. So it breaks up and makes more distinct what the thing is. Statement is speech signifying the true or the false. Or you could say it's a sentence signifying the true or the false. You don't find the true or the false except in statements. So unless you form a statement, you can't understand the true or the false. Now the third act, reasoning, is perfected by syllogism or some other kind of argument. And syllogism is speech in which some statements laid down, and usually just two of them, right? 
another follows necessarily because of those laid down. So if I lay it down, for example, that no speech is a name and every definition is a speech, it follows necessarily that no definition is a what? Name, right? Or if I lay it down that no speech is a name and every statement is a speech, then no statement is a what? Name. Okay? And likewise, if syllogism is a speech and no speech is a name, no syllogism is a name. Okay? So these three speeches are three tools by which the aforesaid three acts are directed or ordered or perfected. So we can say that logic is about those three acts or it's about these three speeches which are the tools for perfecting those acts. Now perhaps there is a um, multiplicity of meaning there in the phrase about something. I think you could say that logic is about these three acts more as its end or purpose. Huh? Logic is for the sake of perfecting, directing, ordering these three acts. But it's about those three tools, those three speeches, more as its subject or matter. So you could say the logic of the first act is really about definition chiefly. And the logic of the second act is chiefly about statement. And the logic of the third act is chiefly about the syllogism. And some other kinds of argument, but chiefly about the syllogism. Okay? Is that clear? Any question about that? Can you just repeat how you phrase reasoning as a speech? But well, reasoning is the name of an act. Huh? And, and, and syllogism. Yeah, syllogism is speech in which some statements laid down. Comma. <laughs> Another follows necessarily because of those laid down. Okay. We'll be coming back to these definitions as we take up each of these. Huh? Okay. So we're now in the logic of the first act, which is the logic of definition. Now, I try, when I do this text here, you can notice I have a lot of uh, little titles there, sometimes two or three on a page. That kind of gives you the topic being discussed, right? And as I tell students sometimes, you know, when you're studying for this, um, look at the title and see if you can recall without read the text again and then come back and read the text again, right? Okay. So why should name be considered before definition? Huh? We gave three reasons there. Huh? And the first reason was that we name a thing before we define it. And this goes back to the natural road because we know things in a confused or indistinct way before we know them distinctly. And so, um, you don't have to have as distinct a knowledge to name a thing as you have to to uh, define it. Then. So it's natural in that sense for us to name things before we define them. And that's what we usually do. But secondly, when we seek a definition, when we ask for a definition, like Socrates is doing all the time in the dialogues, we use the name of the thing to be defined. So Socrates asks Mino, what is virtue, right? Or he asks Euthyphro, what is piety, right? Or he asks Theotetus, what is episteme? Huh? And he's always asking that question. Huh? Okay? So if you don't understand names a bit, you don't understand the question, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that you're seeking a definition of the name so much, you're thinking a definition of the thing, right? But you have to name the thing you want to have somebody define. Okay? 
But the third and the most important reason why we have to talk about a name before a definition is that a definition is composed of names. It's put together from names. Huh? And every speech is ultimately put together from names. As you recall, the definition of name is the same in four parts, in its first four parts, as the definition of speech. They're both a sound, eh? they're both a vocal sound, they're both vocal sounds that signify, and signify by human agreement or custom rather than by nature. But the speech has parts that signify by themselves. And the name has no parts that signify by themselves. So every speech is composed of two or more, what, names. Huh? Okay. I notice the word name there, as I explained later on here, is a little bit broader in meaning than sometimes in daily speech, where we think mainly of name and noun as being the same thing. But notice the definition of name here could apply to what? The verb or the adjective as well, right? Huh? Okay, so colored <laughs> or just right is fits the definition of what name right and walks or runs does right. Okay, but white man or man walks that's already a speech. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, this word be more narrow than word. Name. Yeah, somewhat done. Huh? Because you may even call an article maybe a word, right? Huh? Okay. But a little ambiguity there in English, right? Sometimes word and name are used almost synonymously, right? Okay. But if anyone's a little bit broader, perhaps word is. Huh? Okay. Incidentally, when you get into uh, Greek or Latin there, they have the same word for name and for noun, huh? And so when you read the, the Perihermeneus of Aristotle, and you read the Greek commentators and so on, they're always explaining, you know, when he's using the word onoma <laughs> as common to noun and verb, and when he's using it as noun as opposed to verb, right? And in Latin you have, you know, nomen and verbum, right? Nomen also means noun, huh? But in English we are a little richer there. Right? Okay, so the name... But we, we tend, even English, to sometimes identify name with what? Noun, right? Huh? Okay. But name is a little bit broader. Now, the next thing to be considered is what should you consider about name, right? Okay. And obviously, we want to define name, and we want to distinguish between the name of the thing being defined and the names, but to use in the definition. And you learned a rule of logic, it seems, in grade school or high school, that the name of the thing being defined should not be one of the names in the what? Definition. definition huh? And certainly not with the same meaning, right? <laughs> okay? So, we have to, in order to understand name and definition, we have to distinguish between the name of the thing being defined and the names that are actually found in the definition. Okay? And since there's going to be more than one name in the definition, it's a speech, right? We have to see what difference there is among those names. And as we'll see, there's not only a difference there, but an order among the names that are in the definition and so on. Okay? <clears throat> now the next thing is the definition of name and logic, and we've touched upon that here a number of times. The first word in the definition of name is sound. Okay? And the logician leads to the natural philosopher to consider the nature of sound. He takes the notion we all have of sound. Now the second part of the definition of name is that it's a vocal sound. And again, the logician leads to the natural philosopher the question of how these sounds, these vocal sounds, are produced. Huh? Now, the third part of the definition is signifies. Huh? 
And perhaps when I clear my throat, that's a vocal sound, but it's not intended to signify something. Uh, the definition of sign that is uh, traditional is the one from St. Augustine, right? Which I translate a bit freely as that which strikes the senses and brings to mind something other than itself. Huh? So its first meaning, at least, a sign is always something sensible, right? But apart from, as Augustine says, the species or form that it imprints upon the senses, it brings to mind something else, right? Okay. So, in the automobile there, you give a signal, right? You better turn left or right, huh? The press says, the traffic experts tell you when you see that blinking light to the right, what does that signify? The only thing you'd be sure about is that the guy's system works, right? Because sometimes he, he doesn't know it's on, right? But, um, you know, the red light, huh? The sign, right? To stop, and the green light to, to go, and so on, right? Huh? Okay. But words are, are sound when you hear them, something else what, comes to mind. Huh? Okay. The fourth part of the definition of name is that it signifies by custom, or we could say by human agreement. Huh? And this is to distinguish it from uh, vocal sounds that signify by nature, like a baby's cry. Huh? So it's natural for the baby to cry when they're hungry or they're in pain or something of this sort, right? And if something kicks you in the stomach or punches you in the stomach, you naturally get something of a groan, right? And that's why these sounds like a baby's cry or a man's groan or a woman's scream when she's attacked on the street or something <laughs> are known and understood around the world, right? Because they're naturally signifying them. But if I say something in a language that you're not accustomed to, then you don't understand what I'm saying, right? So if I end up in the hospital in some foreign country and the doctor and I speak each other's language, right? We can understand my groaning, that's an actual sound, right? But my words he maybe wouldn't understand or vice versa. Okay? And the last part of the definition of name is no part of which signifies by itself, right? Okay. And so even if a, a word was um, made up of other words, right? When it's functioning as a name, the individual parts don't what? Yeah. So if you call me Berquist, which comes from the Swedish word berg, originally berg meaning mountain, and quist meaning branch, right? Well, you're not really signifying what? Mountain branch, are you? You're signifying this man, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. We had friends whose name was Johnson, right? Huh? Okay. And the John and son in the name Johnson, right? Don't signify anything. And so even the woman could be called Johnson, <laughs> even though she's not a son, and, and maybe her father's not even named John, right? Okay. Does the parts here even just refer to the letters, individual letters instead? It can be the syllables, the letters, right? Okay. okay. And notice, uh, as we mentioned before, the the grammarian, huh? in his analysis of language, he goes down to the letters, right? When I learn Greek, whatever Greek I know, first thing you learn is the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. You learn the letters, right? Huh? And then you talk about syllables and so on, right? And likewise, the poetic science, and even to some extent rhetoric, huh? they want to talk about um, the syllables, right? because the poet especially wants to write things in maybe meter, and that's meaning long and short syllables, or accented and unaccented syllables, and order those things. And he wants to maybe rhyme or alliterate, huh? and so the last letter or the first letter, right? But the logician, he doesn't care about such things, right? His analysis goes down as far as the name, which is, you might say, the smallest unit that signifies, right? But Shakespeare would say, full fathom five, thy father lies. And all those words begin with the letter F, right? Huh? Full fathom five, 
by father of eyes. And therefore you can see why you can't translate the poet. Huh? Because the words that would mean full and fathom and father and five in, say, French, wouldn't begin with the same, what, letter, right? Okay. Or in Shakespeare there, they're always, I think in Romeo and Juliet, for example, but very commonly they're, they're rhyming love and dove, right? Huh? And the dove, of course, is the animal, the symbol of love, right? So it's very appropriate in English that love and dove rhyme, and the dove already has that connection with, with love, huh? But maybe the word for love and for dove in another language would not, what, rhyme, right? Huh? And it might have, you know, a more, might have two syllables instead of one syllable. <laughs> so the task of translating is almost, what, impossible, really, to, you know, you really lose the, uh, the, the flavor, you might say, right? Okay. But uh, you have the same problem exactly in philosophy because you're not concerned with alliterating or rhyming or... Uh, putting things in meter, right? Um, the magician is a clod in that sense, right? <laughs> he couldn't care. <laughs> Plus, when the words rhyme or, you know, whatever, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, um, in the next section here at the bottom of page two, we're talking about um, calling a thing by some name, right? Huh? And we're talking a little bit about now the name of the thing you're going to be what defining, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. But in general, we're saying that you can call something by its own name or by the name of another thing. Mm -hmm. No, part one here is about names, and then part two will be about definition itself. Huh? Okay. <coughs> Around page two is what I said. Okay. Um, so, uh, Romeo can call Juliet. Huh? He can call her by her own name, which is Juliet. Or he can call her by the name of another thing, right? Now, if he slips up and calls her Rosalind, who he's in love with, as you know before, he could be in trouble, right? He's, he's made a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if a child calls a cat a dog, or vice versa, sometimes you see a little child do, right? Um, he's not calling it by its own name, but by the name of another thing, and he's mistaken, right? But there's another way in which you can call something by the name of another thing, and not be mistaken, right? So when Romeo calls Juliet honey, or sweet, or something of this sort, he's not calling Juliet by her own name, but by the name of a what? Another thing. But he's not mistaken as if he called her Rosalind or something, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a mistake you ought to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, this is an example of what they call a figure of speech, right? And the greatest figure of speech, perhaps, the metaphor, huh? Okay. And um, uh, Thomas, in his commentary on uh, one of St. Paul's epistles, where St. Paul uses irony, and Thomas wants to explain that St. Paul is not saying something false. Mm -hmm. He's speaking ironically, right? Okay. Uh, he gives a good explanation of what figurative speech is. Huh? And he says that um, in figurative speech, the meaning of the word is not the meaning of the speaker. So when uh, Romeo calls Juliet honey, he doesn't mean that she's that yellow substance produced by the bees, right? Okay. Um, when St. Paul, you know, uh, uses irony, right? Huh? Um, you know, if I come in and I find one of my students drunk under the table and I say, what a fine example of such a college student. <laughs> mm -hmm. He knows I don't mean what my words say, right? Huh? Okay. But there's a connection between the meaning of the word and the meaning of the speaker. And in the case of metaphor, the connection is one of some likeness. Huh? As honey is sweet and pleasant, right? So Juliet is, is, is pleasant, right? Okay. And irony, you're saying the opposite, right? Okay. 
uh, the James Bond movie one time where he knocks the guy over into the bathtub, right? And he grabs such a wire and <laughs> the guy. <laughs> I heard somebody say, you know, around me in the theater. Do you mean something like what you said, what the word means? In irony, you mean the opposite. I can find it for you, but you know, but it, it, it might be the Galatians, you know. Okay, be critical. Um, but Snecticky is another example, right? Where you call something by the uh, uh, the name of the whole you give to the part, or vice versa. He's a brain, right? <laughs> no, he's a human being, <laughs> but he's a human being in which that part. <laughs> stands out for some reason or other, right? Okay, or as Aristotle says in the 10th book in the Moroccan Ethics, that reason more than anything else is man, right? Okay, that's kind of synecdoche. Or the word was made flesh, right? Okay. Likewise, when I say somebody is a Romeo, what do I mean? This is now what? In Tone of Asia, huh? Okay, he's a Romeo. I don't mean he's, you know, that citizen of Verona. Up, unfortunately, right? I mean, he's a what? A lover, right? Huh? See? But everybody recognizes Romeo as a famous example of a lover, right? If I say he's a Don Juan or a Casanova or something, right? Okay. If I say about my student, he's another Einstein, right? He's an Einstein. <laughs> That'd be quite a compliment, right? You see? Okay. Um, now, there's a reason why we call things. Uh, by the name of another thing, figuratively, you know? and uh, especially this most famous one, like metaphor, it's especially to express emotion or to arouse emotion, huh? but it also appeals to the what? Imagination. Huh? There's a likeness there that appeals to imagination. And Thomas, incidentally, in this commentary in the sentences there, uh, he points out that one reason why we have metaphors in scripture, there are many, many reasons, huh? But one reason is that the imagination, like every other part of us, should be subject to God. And so by using metaphors, we bring in the what, imagination. Just like when we genuflect, we bring in our knees and our legs, right? But the imagination is a, is a higher and more noble faculty than the legs, right? And uh, it's much more dangerous, in a sense, as far as leading us astray. <laughs> So it's necessary to subject the imagination even to what? God, right? Mm -hmm. And the metaphor brings imagination into the service of God. Okay. That's only totally one reason. There are many other reasons mm -hmm. for use metaphors. Um, so it's very common among lovers and so on that they will use metaphors to partly express their emotion but also to arouse emotion, right? Okay. But likewise, if, if I come home and I'm hoping to have another piece of pie or something and you you have a whole pie by yourself, and I say, you pig, you know? <laughs> well, I don't mean that you're a four-footed animal with a tail and a snout, which is something like that. And uh, this, in a sense, expresses my emotion better than saying you're a glutton, right? And uh, it also uh, maybe arouses you, you know, you kind of press up a bit being called a pig, than if you <laughs> call it a glutton, see? Um, but now, if you want to define something, should you call it by its own name or by the name of another thing? Yeah. Why? Why that? Because it's the, you want to know if your reason. Not, you're not trying to move your emotions. Or okay. And it's there for not so clear. When I say, "What is a pig?" Right? What am I asking for? It's not so clear, right? And obviously, if I use the incorrect name, if I say, "What is a cat?" and I'm, I'm asking about what is a dog, <laughs> that's entirely misleading, right? But even if I'm using the, the figurative thing, right? You know, what is a pig? You know, it's not as clear as the question, what is a what? Glutton, right? Huh? Okay. So the logician then, when he um, names a thing and, and uses a name to ask for a definition, he wants to use the thing's own name, right? Mm -hmm. And not the name of another thing. Not even the figurative <laughs> name. Okay, that's clear enough. Huh? <coughs> Now, having 
seen a distinction here between calling a thing by its own name and by the name of another thing. Then on page four, we can raise a little question, right? Okay. Are we going to define a thing by its own name or by the name of another thing? It seems like you've got a division there, right? And every name is either the name of the thing or it's the name of another thing, right? Okay. Um, Perkus is my name and all these other names are names of other persons or other things. Okay. Uh, now, if you were to define a thing by its own name, then you'd be violating that rule of logic you learned in grade school and high school, right? But you did not use the name of the thing being defined, right? But you can also see the reason for that rule, right? If you ask me, what is a dog? And I say, well, a dog is a dog. That's a true statement, but I don't make dog any more known than it was to begin with. A rose is a rose is a rose, as the poet is supposed to have said, right? Quote this. Um, but if you call it by the name of another thing, right? Well, either use an incorrect name, so if I was to define dog by, let's say, cat, right? Or divide, define dog by triangle, that would be obviously <laughs> more than useless, right? But can you really define a thing by metaphor? A wife or a lover is a honey. Can we tell you what they are? A glutton is a what? Pig. Huh? Well, pig means a four-footed animal with a tail and a snout. Is that what a glutton is? No. So it doesn't really tell you what it is, the figurative name. Huh? Okay. And um, incidentally, you can't use metaphors to say what a metaphor is. You can use metaphors to exemplify a metaphor, but you can't use metaphors to say what a metaphor is. Okay. And when you explain what figurative speech is, you don't use figurative speech, mm -hmm. except a way of example, but not to say what it is. So you seem to be kind of dilemma here, right? Huh? Either use the thing's own name to define it, or use the name of another thing. And there's an objection to both what? Alternatives, right? Okay. So how do we get out of that little dilemma? But what distinction do we come to which is the untying of this dilemma? Hmm? Yeah. The expression um, its own or my own, your own, his own, her own, right? Our own even. Um, that expression has actually what? Two meanings, right? And the first meaning of my own is what belongs to me alone, right? Okay? Like my own head, right? My own nose. No one else breathes through this nose. I don't even breathe too well <laughs> myself. Okay? My own what, teeth, right? Huh? Okay? Then it's always telling me the importance of keeping your own teeth, right? <laughs> okay? Uh, what's the second sense of one's own, his own, her own, your own. Hmm? That's a share in common, so we can speak of our own, I can speak of my own country, Yeah, um, but yet it's also your country, this yeah. country, yeah. but yet it's still my country. Yeah. So I would speak of my own mother, even though she's not right. my mother alone, right? So I have brothers, huh? And I could speak of my own daughter, even though she's not my daughter alone. She's my wife's daughter, too. Okay? And, um, you know, we say to the kids in the neighborhood, or, you know, you're, you're this, you know, go home to your own house. Okay? Why don't you, you know, mess up your own house? <laughs> <laughs> you hear these things all the time, right? Yeah. But that child is not only his house, it's his mother and father's house, and he's got brothers and sisters, it's their house, right? Okay? 
Now this is a distinction that we can um, make not only in logic, but we can make it in what? Practical philosophy, huh? It's very important, huh? So, um, as a philosopher, what is my good? So, I might say it's, it's truth, right? Okay. But is truth my own good <laughs> as a philosopher, and in what sense of my own? Second sense. Yeah. It's a common good, right? Huh? Now, common good in the strictest sense huh, is a good that can be shared by many at the same time and with no diminution, right? So if I understand the Pythagorean theorem, it doesn't prevent you from understanding it, right? Mm -hmm. If anything, my understanding it might be a help, you know, to your understanding mm -hmm. it, right? But um, um, if we have an apple pie in common, right? If we, you know, put our money together, we buy an apple pie. Huh? Then we can't, uh, if we share that, no one of us is going to get the whole apple pie. Right? Okay? So that's not a common good in the, in the fullest or most perfect sense, right? Okay? Or if we have, let's say, a, a, uh, a computer in common, right? But we can't both, what? Yeah. Use it at the same time, right? Huh? Or we have a chair that, doesn't belong to me, you can sit in it too, either one of us can sit in it, but we can't both sit in it at the same time. Mm -hmm. okay. But truth is very much, in a very perfect sense, a common good, because my knowing a truth in no way prevents you from knowing that truth. If anything, it can be a help to your coming to know it, right? And um, the same way with, if it's already with God, right? Huh? The first truth. Huh? My um, knowing and loving God in no way prevents you from knowing and loving God. If anything, it should be a help to your knowing and loving God. Huh? Okay. And it's interesting that my greatest goods, like truth or God himself, right? My greatest good is not the good that belongs to me alone, right? Okay. And the same way, you know, as, as, as a parent, our greatest good is our children, huh? Okay. And as a citizen, you know, the common good of the country, right? As a member of the basketball team or the football team, the victory, right? Huh? You know, but victory is a good that we all, what? Everybody in the team shares in, right? Huh? Okay. So, um, my good as a member of the team is victory in the second sense of my good, right? So it's very important to see that distinction, huh? Otherwise, when you defend your country, say, you wouldn't be um, acting for your good. <laughs> You'd be simply a, a slave or something, right? Mm -hmm. okay. When I defend the truth, in the way I'm defending my good, but not my private good, right? A lot of people are stuck on that first meaning of my own. Huh? That's why I put this in the form of an objection, because at first, you know, people don't see a way out of that, huh? And uh, because they're kind of stuck on the first meaning of my own. Okay. okay. So that's the solution. But as I say, it's, it's a important distinction for other parts of philosophy as well as for logic. Huh? Question on page five. A little problem in the text, maybe a typo or something trying to figure out. Um, page five, the uh, uh, second full paragraph beginning the role we all learn. Mm -hmm. Okay, then uh, a couple sentences down where it says induction shows. Induction shows that this is a we missing there or something? Induction shows that Yeah, the we, uh, yeah. Is it yeah. we? Yeah. we define? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Elopsis is the kind of good say. <laughs> <coughs> that was an example of induction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I noticed there at the end of that uh, section there, the next paragraph. Um, you know, when I call a dog an animal, am I calling it by its own name? In that second term. Yeah. Because the dog is an animal, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
but it's not its own in the sense that it's the name that distinguishes a dog from yeah. everything else, right? Yeah. Cat and horse and so on. So, <clears throat> we're going to um, define a thing by its own names in the second sense of its own. Okay. But that means then names that are common to it and something else, right? Or a name that is said of many things, right? Okay. Now we say names said of many things, huh? The word many here has, you know, two meanings, huh? Uh, sometimes we oppose many to few, and sometimes many to what? One, right? So when I say it's a name set of many things, I mean many as opposed to one, right? It's set of more than one, right? Okay. Now, if you think about uh, the word definition itself, uh, it comes from the Latin word finis, meaning end or limit. Huh? And the Greek words for definition, like horas huh? and horizmas, so we get the word horizon, they come from the Greek word for limit or end, too. And this fits, in a sense, what uh, the definition is supposed to do. It's supposed to put, as it were, draw a line around, right, the thing you're defining and separate it from everything else. Huh? And just as the city limits of, let's say, Worcester, right, huh, should contain every part of Worcester within them, right, but no part of any other surrounding town, right? So likewise, the definition of a thing should draw a line around that thing and separate from everything else, but not include anything else within it. Huh? So it's a very precise idea, the idea of limit. Huh? It contained neither more nor less than that which it is a limit. Right? And, you know, if you go back to the Latin, you know, uh, it had a concrete meaning in daily life, huh? where a farmer would define his field when he put up, what, a fence around there, right? Huh? Okay. And that fence should fence in only my property, right? And not anybody else's property. Um, but the question is then, how can you define a thing by names that are common to it and what? Other things, right? So that seems to be contrary to what a definition is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to fit just this one thing, and if you uh, form the definition by names that are common to it and something else, how are you getting something that fits just this one thing. What's the solution to that problem? Combination. Yeah. yeah. The combination has to fit just that one thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when somebody tries to define something, huh, you often see, you know, Socrates will see if the definition and the thing being defined are what they call convertible, right? Now, convertible in logic has a different meaning than convertible instead of the automobile, right? Okay. A and B are said to be convertible if every A is a B and what? Every B is A. Yeah, yeah. And the definition should be convertible with the thing being what? Defined, right? So if equilateral and right-angled quadrilateral is the definition of square, right? Then every square should be an equilateral and right-angled quadrilateral. And every equi ang e equilateral and right-angled quadrilateral should be a what? Square, square right? Huh? So you'll see sometimes in the dialogue, Socrates turning around somebody's definition, right? Mm -hmm. To see if it is in fact what? Convertible, right? Huh? Sometimes in class, you know, I ask the student, what is a chair, right? And maybe they'll come out with something to sit on, right? And they say, well, every chair is something to sit upon, right? But is everything to sit upon a chair? See? 
as a bench might be something to sit on, a, a saddle, <laughs> but these are not chairs, right? Huh? So you have to add something before this speech is convertible, right? That's one thing you check, right? It's kind of the first thing you expect of a definition, is that it be speech that is convertible with the thing being what? Defined. And I make an interesting comparison there to um, pinpointing, you know, a uh, target. Let's say you want to bomb a target or you want to go someplace. And you give the longitude and you give the what latitude, right? Now if you stop and think about the longitude uh, is really a line, right? And there's on that longitude as many points as you want. <laughs> so in a way, to give the longitude of a point is to give what it has in common with an infinity of other points, right? Now, how does that help you to pinpoint something, right? By telling what it has in common with an infinity of other points. Seems crazy, doesn't it? And likewise, the latitude gives what that point has in common with an infinity of, what? of other points, right? But there's only one point that has both that longitude and that what? latitude, right? Huh? So it shouldn't be so surprising, you know, that in a definition, right, huh, you can, what, have a combination of names, right, that fit only one thing, right? So going back to the example there of, of, of the definition of square, um, quadrilateral is a name common not only to square, but to oblong and rhombus and rhomboid and trapezium, right? And equilateral is a name common to the square and the uh, rhombus, huh? like a jerk square, you know. And uh, right angled is common to the square and the oblong, right? But the combination of these, equilateral and right angle, quadrilateral, seems to fit only what? The square, right? Aristotle's talking about tragedy and comedy, right? And the epic there in the beginning of the poetics. And he takes the example of the great epic writer, who's Homer, right? And Sophocles, the great tragic writer. And Aristophanes, the comic poet, right? And he says, well, uh, Homer and Sophocles have in common that they represent great men, huh? The downfall of great men and so on. But Sophocles and what? Have in common that they represent things as acted out rather than simply narrated, right? Okay. And then he starts to combine these things, right? Huh? So in the definition of um, tragedy, there'll be something in common with epic, right? Representation of serious things of men greater than us, right? And something they have in common with comedy, right? that it represents things now, not simply by narrating them, but by acting them on the stage and so on. But the combination of these differences are going to fit only what? Tragedy, right? So I start to define tragedy as a likeness of an action or course of action that is serious, complete, and of some magnitude. Uh, in sweetened language, right? Acted out rather than narrated, right? Huh? But acted out as a kind of comedy, as a representation of an action that is serious, complete, and some magnitude with, with epic, right? But the combination of the two fits only what? Tragedy, right? Huh? Um, now notice, huh? If each name in the definition is common to the thing being defined, and at least one other thing, right? No name represents a completely distinct knowledge of the thing being defined, does it? But each name represents a somewhat <coughs> confused knowledge of the thing being defined, huh? Because no name separates it from everything else. But as you put the names together, you go from a confused knowledge of what you're defining to a knowledge in which it is separated from everything else. And I think, you know, you can see how the natural world enters in there, right? 
natural road is from the confused to the distinct, then. Huh? And the definition takes you from uh, the many partial, confused thoughts about the thing being defined to a, what? Altogether distinct notion of what the thing is, huh? Okay. So now we come to the point where we want to talk about name said of what? Many things. Is your name common to many things? Huh? What you were just saying is, is that always true? Um, some of the terms like rational. What would you say? <coughs> well, we have to define rational, and that would be yeah. composed. We well, see. It was kind of common to give as an example of a definition of logic, uh, the definition of man as rational animal, right? But it's not really a good example in this sense that it doesn't exemplify what you're going to find in almost all definitions, huh? That no name it really fits just the one thing, right? And of course, rational is actually taken from um, a property of man, huh? That's how you get something convertible with man. Huh? We'll talk about property later on. But if you go back to Porphyry, right, you always give it as an example of a definition of man, something like a, a rational mortal animal, right? <laughs> and of course, with the opinion of the Platonists, right, that there were immortal rational mm-hmm. animals, right? But then no part of the definition belongs only to uh, mm-hmm. man, right? So the fact that they take rational animal as an example there in logic books is kind of a sign of their misunderstanding or ignorance really of the logic right mm-hmm. okay and when, when uh, Porphyry defines uh, difference when we do here later on it's still something common to what many things other in kind huh? okay so we're down now to the need to talk about name common to many things or name said of many things now, Albert the Great, in his logical works, he says, the first thing we need to talk about in logic is the universal. Okay? But this is more sensible, meaning more close to sensible, right? Mm-hmm. To say the first thing we really have to talk about in logic is name said of what? Many things, huh? Name common to many things, huh? And even the name of the thing being defined huh, is common to many things. You don't define Socrates, you define man. You don't define Lassie, you define dog, right? You don't define champion, ginocrosaurus, but horse, right? So even the, the name of the thing being defined is a name said of what? Many things. And even more so, the names that inside the definition. So now we have to talk about names said of many things, right? Okay. Now, um, the fundamental <coughs> distinction of names said of many things is the, we we'll use the Latin words here, names said of many things with, yeah, we might take a little break. He'll, he'll tell us exactly when he needs because it might take another time. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, the fundamental distinction now of names said of many things is whether you have one meaning in mind, right? Whether you have the same meaning in mind when you say this one word of many things, right? Or whether you have, what, many meanings in mind, right? Okay? Do you want to pause now? <coughs> Hard for that. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, now notice, huh? Most names probably have many meanings, huh? and um, but even if a name has many meanings, you can say it of many things with one meaning in mind. Take the word bad, for example. The word bad is equivocal in the sense that it has many meanings, right? And um, it can mean the piece of wood used in baseball, right? 
we're going to mean the flying mouse that's in the belfry, right? Okay. And if it were said of those two, you'd be said of them equivocally, right? Because you wouldn't be calling this piece of wood a bat for the same reason you call this flying mouse a bat, right? You don't have the same thought in mind, the same meaning in mind. But if you said the word bat just of, let's say, three baseball bats, then that word would be said, what? Univocally, right? Or with one meaning, huh? Okay. And we use the Latin word univocal or univocally, the adverb, uh, for uh, with one meaning, right? Okay. So we can say that a name said univocally of many things is a name said with one meaning in mind of many things, right? But you have the same meaning or the same reason, you might say, right? For calling each of these the same, right? So the word man is said of each of us, right? Um, is being said univocally, right? Huh? Each of us is being called a man because we're a animal with reason, right? Okay. Likewise, if animal is being said of man and a dog, it's being said univocally because you have the same meaning in mind. It's a living body with sensation, huh? Okay. If quadrilateral is said of square and oblong and rhombus and rhomboid, it's said univocally because you have the same meaning in mind. It's a plane figure, a rectilineal plane figure contained by four straight lines. Huh? Okay. Now maybe, um, uh, it's not in this text here, but maybe sometime we can talk about equivocal names. Huh? Okay. Um, let's maybe make a little footnote here, a little petition here. Name equivocal. By chance, a name equivocal by reason. Okay? <clears throat> That word bat, instead of the baseball bat and the flying mouse, it's by chance that they both are called a what, bat. Huh? Some of them look at the baseball bat and the flying mouse, the theater mouse, <laughs> and say, um, I see that they have something in common, or I see some connection between these two, right? Um, but now, sometimes, a name is said of many things equivocally by what? Reason. Huh? There's reason why they have the same name. Huh? So if I say, for example, I see you, right? And I say, now I can see my son now. Meaning I what? can picture my son in my imagination. Is that a chance that I call both of those things? Here I can see a certain likeness huh, of um, my picturing my son, right, to my seeing you, right? When I dream, I imagining, I think it's like seeing, and you see by the likeness. Huh? So there's a reason why they're both called seeing, right? And so we speak of such a name as being equivocal by reason and both to some are equivocal by chance. Now these words that are equivocal by reason are very important in philosophy, right? And especially they're important in wisdom. In fact, all the key words in wisdom are equivocal by reason. But you could say the words in the axioms are all equivocal by reason. Was there a scholar who discovered this? He discovered that the most common words are all equivocal by reason. And if these are the words used also in the axioms, and if these are the words that are used especially in wisdom. In fact, yes, one of the 14 books of wisdom there, 14 books of metaphysics, is devoted to distinguishing the meanings of the key words in wisdom and in the axioms and everywhere, right? The words that are equivocal by reason. And we had a couple examples here earlier. We talked about the word to see and to do this now again, right? Mm -hmm. But we have a little text of Aristotle where he talked about the word before, right? Mm -hmm. and the word before 
um, is a, a word that is equivocal by reason. And as you know, reason looks before and after. There's an order among those four meanings of the word before. Before in time, before the, before the discourse of reason, before the sense of better. So, in a word that's equivocal by chance, there's no order among the meanings. But in a word that's equivocal by reason, there's going to be a certain order of prediction among the meanings. So some people say that, that logic is not philosophy in the same sense that geometry or natural philosophy or philosophy. But it's a tool for acquiring geometry. You can see Euclid is starting with definitions and statements, and then he has syllogisms, right? Um, so it's not purely by chance, it's not purely equivocal or by chance that we call logic philosophy. If it's not philosophy in the same sense as geometry, natural philosophy, and wisdom, it's a tool for acquiring logic, I mean, uh, geometry, natural philosophy, and wisdom. Right? So there's a connection between the two, right? Okay. <coughs> but that word convertible, right? That seems to be almost purely equivocal there. Kind of an automobile, right? <laughs> Okay, now we can come back sometime <coughs> and talk more about being equivocal by reason, how that takes place. But this is the fundamental distinction, being equivocal by chance and by reason. Now sometimes the name equivocal by reason they want to call um, analogous, right? And sometimes the one that's equivocal by chance they'll call just equivocal or purely equivocal. I think it's better to call them uh, by chance and by reason, you know, what you're talking about. And analogous there um, is actually taken from one kind of name equivocal by reason, so you tend to get to narrow understanding of all the various ways that names are equivocal by reason. <coughs> The most common uh, mistake in thinking Aristotle says in the book called the On Such Reputations is for mixing up the senses of a word. Huh? And you do so mainly with the ones that are equivocal by reason because the meanings have a certain similarity or close connection and you mix them up. <coughs> What's an idea in English? What's an idea? Read John Locke, he's always talking about ideas. Or, well, yeah? But sometimes an idea is a what? Uh, image, yeah. 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 So, so um, if the girl says to the guy, don't get ideas, yeah. she probably is using ideas in the sense of what? Image, right? Yeah. Okay? He's not doing too much thinking now, right? <laughs> but he's imagining it. But when we say the philosopher's ideas, it should be thoughts and not just images. Huh? So Locke is often confusing idea in the sense of image with idea in the sense of what? Thought, right? Okay. But that's probably what equivocal by reason, huh? And that's why Thomas, you know, spoke of how the Arab philosophers actually like reference to that. Uh, they speak of the first act of reason as kind of an imagination through the understanding, right? <laughs> Okay. There's sort of likeness there, right? When I imagine something, I form an image of it. When I think about something, I form a thought. Huh? Image and thought are not the same thing. Huh? If you study uh, John Locke, you'll see that he really confuses the two. Huh? Okay. Okay. <coughs> And when you define something, you want to first know what meaning you have in mind, like it down to one meaning, right? So, what we're going to talk about next is name said univocally of many things, right?
in the first book, really, that in the Greek philosophical tradition that's come down to us as a part of logic, then, was a book written by Porphyry, right? And Porphyry was a, one of the Neoplatonic philosophers, later Platonic philosophers. These are ours there. And ours too, like these. <laughs> uh, Porphyry wrote a, a uh, isagoge, which is the Greek word meaning introduction. He wrote an isagoge introduction to Aristotle's categories, the book that Thomas referred to. The only book that's come down to us from Aristotle from the logic of the first act is this book called The Categories. We'll see what it's about. And Porphyry wrote this for a student who was having a hard time understanding the categories of Aristotle, right? And so Porphyry wrote a book which was called The Introduction to the Categories. And what he actually does in that book is to distinguish the names said to dedicate them. But as he says in the Gramium too, his um, Isagoge, you usually see this kind of the English form, Isagoge, meaning into the um, You'll point out that the Isagoge is useful not only for understanding categories, but for definition, he says, and for division, and for demonstration, which is the most perfect kind of syllogism. And so we'll see that when we get when we go through this um, how it's useful. But it's especially we, at this point we're interested in the view to definition, right? Okay. Now Porphyry divides these names said you didn't give any things eventually into five. Huh? But we can arrive at those five by three divisions. Either the name which is said of many things signifies something like inside their nature, right? Being by nature not what they are, or it signifies something outside their nature, right? Okay? So name said you never give many things signifying something inside their nature, mean by nature what they are, or it signifies something outside. So if you had three triangles, and you said triangle of them, or you said, or generally plain figure of them, or figure, you'd be saying something that signifies something inside their nature. But if you said green of the three triangles, you'd be signifying something what? Outside their nature. Outside of what they are. Right? So this division is obviously exhaustive. Either it signifies something inside the nature of the video which you said, or it signifies something outside the nature. There is no other uh, alternative, right? Mm -hmm. okay. It's like the number can be divided into odd or even, right? Okay. Now he's going to subdivide, or we're going to subdivide both. And the first here, we're going to subdivide into three. And the second, we're going to subdivide into what? Two. Okay. On this great rule, two or three. <laughs> okay. Now, the first word that, or first name that he talks about, is called in the Greek. The genos, huh? In Latin, you have almost the same word genus, right? And in English, we take over the word genus from the Latin, right? Okay. Now, 
of the genus. The name said of many things. It's a name signifying what it is. Now, if I ask in class, what is a dog? The students will usually answer, it's an animal, right? Now, animal there is an example of a genus, right? It's a name said with one meaning of many things other in kind, like dog, cat, horse, elephant, right? It signifies what it is, right? Okay. It signifies it in a very, what, general way, we say in English, right? Mm -hmm. The word general, it's a logically related to the word genus, right? Okay? Um, again, why do we tend to start with the genus. Because we're now first confused. Yeah. 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 Whereas the genus represents a confused understanding of what the thing is, right? Confused because it's understanding what it is in common with many other things. And therefore it's not distinguishing one of those kinds from another, is it? I ask students, what is a sonnet? And they'll say it's a poem, right? Mm -hmm. okay. But the sonnet is only one, what? Mm -hmm. Kind of poem. There are many other kinds of poems besides the sonnet, huh? Okay. If I ask somebody, what is a tragedy or a comedy, what are they going to say? Yeah, it's a play or a drama, right? Okay. But play or drama, example again would be genius, right? Okay. Um, when I say reason is an ability, right? Well, not the only ability, there are many different kinds of ability that man has, right? And reason may be a very important one, but it's still you know one of many <laughs> abilities we have. Huh? The name said with one meaning of many things other in kind signifying what it is. Huh? No, I think I'll get myself moved here for now. Let me this temporarily. Now, the second name we talk about is the name of one of these particular things that are in the genus, right? Okay. Now the Greek word they use for that is eidos, right? And the Latin word they use is what? Species, huh? And both eidos in Greek and species in Latin they have the sense of a form, but of a form you can, what, see. Eidos is related to the Greek word eidenai, mean to see, right? And species is related to the word speculative, speculation, mm. specular, to look, right? So it's the form or shape you see, huh? In English, we tend to borrow either the Latin word species, right? Or sometimes we simply use the word, what, form in Latin, in English, right? Okay. So species is the one that you use in logic. So species is the name of a particular kind of thing. Under a genus. So if 
the, the genus is animal, and cat and dog and horse and elephant would be what? Species, right? Species is one of those funny words that is spelled the same way, I guess, in the singular and the plural. <laughs> okay. Um, if the genus is what like government, right? Then maybe monarchy and oligarchy and democracy and so on would be different species of what government, right? Mm-hmm. Then, okay. But in English, you might speak of them as to be forms of what government, right? Okay. If play or drama is the genus, maybe tragedy and comedy are the species, right? Maybe there's a, another species in between tragedy and comedy. <laughs> um, if quadrilateral is the genus, then square and oblong and rhombus and rhomboid, right? And trapezium uh, are the species under that genus, right? The names of the species, huh? the forms of quadrilateral. Sometimes we don't have a name, like a square, um, but you could say, in that case, you use a speech in place of the name. You might say the equilateral triangle, an isosceles triangle, and scalene triangle are the species of what? Triangle, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. We have a name for an equilateral triangle. Okay. Um, virtue and vice are names of species under the genus what? Habit. Habit, okay. Good habit and bad habit, and so on. Now, very often, you find that two is not enough, right? And Aristotle points this out in the first book of natural philosophy. Um, in our language is a sign of that. Huh? Three is the first number about which we say all. Now, if you think about these two names, can you see the need for a third name? Yes, because the yeah. species is, yeah. is more particular than a genus, but it doesn't say. So the genus what it doesn't is. tell you what? distinctly what the species is, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if I ask you, what is democracy? And you say, what's well, a form of government, right? Well, so is, you know, oligarchy, so is monarchy, right? Okay? If I ask you, what is, you know, a uh, tragedy, say, what's a play, right? Or a drama. So it's so comedy, right? Then? So there's something in the species in addition to the, what, genus, right? And you need a name to bring out what the species has in addition to the what? Genes, right? Okay. Well, since these uh, species are things other than kind, you need a name that would uh, signify what distinguishes one from the other, what separates one from the other, right? Okay. And so this is the third name, which is appropriately called difference. Uh, sometimes they call more explicitly uh, species making difference, right? Okay. But usually just talk for short the difference. Huh? Species making difference. Now, Porphyry gives, um, when he gets to the species making difference, he gives actually three, uh, in a way, definitions of difference, right? But two of them are in terms of the role of difference, right? The role of difference in defining a species and the role of difference in separating one species from another. So as you can see in the text there, um, you say the difference is the name of what the species has in addition to the genus, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the species is the name 
of what separates one species from another species under the same genus. 